All right, let's get started then. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Anita Nair from uh, Regions Refocus. I'll be the moderator for the call and offer some brief introductory remarks before um, the panelists of speakers from Africa, Caribbean, and the Pacific. Uh, welcome to uh, this webinar, which is called the Post Cotonou Agreement Cross Regional Perspectives and Resistance. So, I'd like to say warmly uh, good afternoon to the Caribbean. Uh, good evening uh, in Africa and Europe, and good morning in the Pacific. And I'm assuming most people in Asia are asleep, but for those who are joining from that region, uh, very welcome to you all as well. Um, please feel free to type any questions or comments you may have during the call. At the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button, and we'll hope to address some of these after the panelists speak. So this webinar is part of a continuing series um, convened by the Gender and Trade Coalition, of which Regions Refocus is one of the co-chairs and serves as its secretariat. And several panelists uh, serve as steering group members, including Dawn, the Pacific Network on Globalization, and uh, Third World Network Africa. So this series has uh, covered what we've called trade justice in the time of COVID-19, covering topics such as the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement in Asia, the African Continental Free Trade Area, and uh, digital trade, for example. And today we're really excited to present uh, a cross-regional discussion uh, on the Post-Cotonou Agreement, which is an impending and critical trade and development deal that will define relations between Europe and 79 African, Caribbean and Pacific countries over the next 20 years. So the negotiations process uh, that Europe put forward in 2018 was really a departure from the earlier Lomé and Cotonou agreements when the Africa, Caribbean and the Pacific negotiated as a bloc. And for the post Cotonou agreement, Europe is negotiating a foundational or what we call a preambular section with the Africa, Caribbean and Pacific uh, as a group, and also three protocols separately with each region. So an Africa European Union protocol, a Pacific European Union protocol, and a Caribbean European Union protocol. So we in civil society find this deeply problematic as it's a divide and conquer strategy, which allows Europe to advance its agenda in each section and fracture a previous spirit of, uh, of South solidarity that existed since the founding of the African Caribbean and Pacific group. And the agenda that the European Union is attempting to advance really seeks to push harmful liberalization, it enhances protection for European investors in Africa, Caribbean and Pacific markets and to secure what um, is uh, in quotes, undistorted access to Africa, Caribbean and Pacific natural resources, which is effectively reinforcing uh, neo-colonial patterns. Now these attempts have thankfully been met with some Africa, Caribbean and Pacific resistance which we see reflected in uh, the latest draft of the agreement um, of the 12th of March that has much stronger preambular section than the previous draft and which preserves some space to push for economic diversification and for transformation, moving away from primary commodity dependence, some around value addition, etc. And so we understand that there is a more recent draft um, of, of June um, uh, and this draft has roughly a third uh, of its more than 100 pages uh, of text that's in brackets, uh, which represents kind of the key disagreements, if you want, between Africa, Caribbean and Pacific and, and Europe. So the fight is very much on. And this webinar will explore what is at stake in these negotiations and what are the opportunities for engaging in this fight. So unlike the prior Cotonou agreement, uh, when civil society was more actively engaged in the negotiations across Africa, Caribbean and the Pacific, this collective engagement has been really challenging in uh, the post Cotonou negotiations, um, largely given the lack of access for civil society and lack of transparency. But all of our networks uh, represented on this call, certainly, and I'm sure many of you um, who have joined us, have been engaged in different configurations within each region and to some extent cross-regionally. So our collective challenge now really is of 
of how to engage moving forward, um, especially as Africa, Caribbean and Pacific countries are struggling to contend with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and state capacity is being drained by these negotiations that have shifted online, um, which has made them more secretive and exclusive of, of civil society. Now we understand that, that, that states are, are expected or, or keen to complete uh, the negotiations by November of 2020. So how can we engage in this crucial policy process in, in this time ahead? And, and what does this mean in each of our regions given the long-standing struggles that, um, that the African, Caribbean, and Pacific states have with the European Union? Uh, what does it mean for the different constituencies that are represented on this call uh, that are all fighting for trade justice, um, intersecting with gender, development, uh, labor issues, small and medium businesses, and so forth. So we're really excited to share uh, with you perspectives on how to continue the struggle and what alternatives uh, we must fight for. Um, I'd like to turn to the speakers now. Um, we have five speakers that we're delighted to be joined by. This is Mirioni Chung from Development Alternatives with Women for a New Era, Dawn, uh, Maureen Penjueli from the Pacific Network uh, of, on Globalization, Tang, David Abdullah from the Movement for Social Justice, Rosalia Hamilton from the Caribbean Philanthropic Alliance, and Tate Homeku Ajay from Third World Network Africa. Uh, I'd like to begin with Marioni, if, if you would, to hear from you, what are your concerns with the latest negotiating draft and what feminist alternatives should be demanded? Uh, thanks, Anita. Hi to everyone. It's a pleasure to be part of this conversation, to share and spotlight the near concluding new EU ACP development trade negotiations for the post cotton Year Agreement. As mentioned, I will be speaking to Dawn's interest in engaging and critically monitoring this process. We have been working together with Maureen and Pang and other Pacific CSOs who have been tracking the negotiations since 2018. The Pacific CSO Collective on post cotton Year includes regional and national um, Pacific CSOs like uh, Piangol, Pang, Oxfam in the Pacific, FCOS, SEEP and other regional networks. So my presentation will start with some general points about post cotton Year and why Don is engaged in the process. Then I will share some of the elements at stake in the evolving draft agreement. And finally, if there's time on my side, then I'll share some lessons on mobilizing and engaging the nego negotiations. Otherwise, I'll move it to the discussion time. So to build upon what um, Anita just introduced, these negotiations are the latest in a set of agreements that determine the relationship between the EU and ACP, agreeing on the terms of their engagement and development assistance. These agreements originally derived from some recognition of the impact that colonial European states have had on ACP countries, and such agreeing to provide support for their development. This historical aspect is important as often the outcomes of negotiations lack development and can in fact be in Europe's advantage. These agreements, named for where they are signed, Lome, Cotonou and soon to be Apia in Samoa, usually last for 20 years and cover an incredibly wide range of issues from development to human rights to environmental conservation to culture and beyond that. There is pressure currently on the ACP to conclude the talks this year to ensure that development assistance from the EU continues to flow. This means that the Pacific and others are being held hostage to a deal in order to receive aid money from the EU. Mm -hmm. The post cotton is also being negotiated in a radically changed geopolitical context. The, EU's, the Euro, Eurozone debt crisis from the end of 2009, Europe's unforeseen migration crisis, the increased membership of the EU with many new members having no direct former colonial relationship or economic obligation to developing countries, the, climate, the crisis of climate change and the Paris Agreement, the UN, 
2030 Agenda on SDGs, Brexit, and COVID-19. These now provide a backdrop to the EU's current position in relation to ACP states. What the EU negotiates under the new agreement will have to benefit the Europeans as a matter of principle. Don is critically engaging the process because, firstly, it is a legally binding 20-year agreement between the European Union and sovereign states in three regions of the Global South, the Pacific, Africa and the Caribbean, that will lock in our ACP governments into compliance with the agreement for 20 years. Secondly, the closed door nature of negotiations, which have been conducted in virtual secrecy, has excluded formal input from civil society organizations to draft text, unless text is leaked to us, as has occurred in the Pacific. The CSO Working Group on Postcotton in the Pacific has essentially pushed in to the process, albeit informally. The trade, investment, and natural resource interests of the EU are being openly pushed through this binding agreement, which will have significant imp development implications for ACP states and their people, not least for women. Um, as a South feminist organization that tracks critiques and challenges, global development frameworks, policies, and binding negotiations between the Global North and Global South countries, from an economic justice, ge gender justice, and ecological justice perspective, Dawn is involved in tracking and trying to influence the contents of this agreement being negotiated between EU and ACP states. We do this from both a Dawn feminist and a Pacific development perspective. In terms of what is, what is at stake, some of the concerns we have been monitoring and highlighting include and are not limited to the following. Firstly, the unrealistic time frame for negotiations and the proposed conclusion of negotiations by the end of 2020. As Anita mentioned, this has split ACP capacities into parallel negotiations on both the foundational document as well as the regional protocols. The ACP negotiators need to be cautioned against a rush to complete negotiations for a binding treaty that is extensive in its coverage and occurring under further restrictions due to COVID-19. On gender equality, some of the text affirms strong commitments to gender equality, but it falls short of affirming women's rights, emphasizing instead the full and enjoyment of human rights by all and everyone's empowerment as a driver for sustainable development. At minimum, under the gender equality section, women's rights should be made explicit, especially given the reality of the denial and or violations of women's rights across ACP regions. Additionally, the evolving draft does not mention CEDAW in the foundational document. This contrasts with the regional protocols such as the Pacific EU protocol, which has a strong section explicitly encouraging the ratification and implementation of CEDAW in its optional protocol. The similar um, Statements occur in the Africa EU protocol and the Caribbean protocol. But the point is the foundational document should include the same commitments to implementing CEDO and its optional protocol as seen in the regional protocols. We carry concerns about the exclusion of sexual minorities and gender non-conforming persons from protection against discrimination indicated by the ongoing bracketing of sexual orientation and gender identity text in the evolving draft. Although preceding language commits parties to promoting respect for and observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms for all, without discrimination based on any ground, ongoing and widespread human rights violations and persecution of persons on the grounds of their sexual orientation and gender identity across ACP regions warrant an explicit commitment to protection of SOGI rights. This is fundamental to the universal protection of human rights. We are also concerned about suspected pinkwashing of the long-standing push to open up communal land ownership systems which protect Pacific people's customary rights in perpetuity to land. The agreement commits Pacific states currently to undertaking legislative reforms to give women's rights to land. In contexts such as most Pacific Island states where land tenure is mostly based on constitutionally protected customary systems of ownership 
This provision in the agreement would potentially open up land for individual ownership and for sale with the risk of indigenous people of the Pacific being dispossessed and becoming landless. On ICT and digital economy, um, the draft fo text focuses on digital divide, access to ICT, digital entrepreneurship, uh, privacy and data protection policies and regulatory framework to protect the production, sale and delivery of data products. The text says nothing about data as an economic resource or about data ownership. This is an important Global South perspective and position that should be brought into and pushed in the ACP negotiations with the EU. Presently, personal data is collected and collated and privately appropriated and sold by mostly northern-based platform companies operating globally. Work is being done by civil society organizations to develop a framework for data governance. More information on this can be obtained from the JustNet coalition. Within the postcard to new though, there is a need to include text that clearly states that data is an economic resource owned by communities but with ownership formally vested in states. And commits parties to operating to ensure that the development of privacy and data protection policies and regulatory frameworks to promote the production, sale and delivery of digital products include recognition of ownership of the ownership of this economic resource. Finally, it is worth commenting that the role of civil society organizations and non-state actors in this agreement is still contentious with outstanding agreement on text. CSOs from the ACP and EU should mobilize to protect CSO space to ensure CSOs thrive in a conducive environment with laws that preserve and broaden the space for CSOs to operate. Um, I will just quickly share some lessons on mobilizing. It's quite short um, and then I'll expand on this later. Uh, the Pacific CSO Collective on Post Cotonou, which uh, Maureen and myself, um, Pang and Dawn have been part of with other Pacific networks, has, been, has remained committed to a, an engagement process to provide an understanding of civil society concerns around the evolving draft and regional protocols and provide some strategic direction. The CSO Collective endeavors together to ensure above all else we protect long-term global South interests in the process of negotiating with the EU. We have made sub written substantive sub submissions on the evolving drafts that have been leaked to us and so informally pushed key concerns, red lines, clarifications and proposed text. We have ex expressed numerous times our ongoing concerns about the unrealistic timeframes for concluding an expanded be binding treaty with the European Union in the absence of access to legal text and a substantive regional and national consultative framework. Um, that's, thank you, that's my presentation and I look forward to the discussions. Thank you so much Mireoni uh, for identifying the key concerns and you know both with the content of the of the draft and the process uh, and the demands that uh, are from a South feminist perspective. Uh, we'll move on uh, to Maureen then also from the Pacific. Um, so Part of what the European Union is, is pursuing are measures as extreme as unrestricted access to marine resources uh, in these negotiations. What are the dangers of such measures to the Pacific? And what are the alternatives that the Pacific is proposing or pursuing? Uh, good morning and thank you, Anita, Regents Refocus, the Gender Trade Group for organizing this webinar. I think it's really, really timely and I'm really pleased and thank you Meroni for really introducing the collective format in which the Pacific has taken in response. Um, to answer your question, Anita, I want to really emphasize a couple of key points, particularly when you're looking at access to resources and particularly oceans and ocean resources, which the Pacific and the Caribbean um, these are kind of key uh, issues for both regions, I believe. Um, what's at stake? And I want to start with really the asymmetry and the unbalanced nature of the negotiations between highly advanced economies such as Europe on one hand 
and least developed developing countries on the other hand. In the Pacific, the least developed countries who've just graduated, including Vanuatu, the Cook Islands, are now reconsidering going back or reversing their graduation status. And I think this is really, really key when you're looking at negotiations of this type about who stands to benefit if you have advanced economies on the other on one hand and developing and developed countries on the other hand. Previous agreements, as, as, as Mironi talked about, one of the key elements is really around development assistance, uh, really to balance and allow for transitional, allow for ACPs to transition through a development cooperation type agreement. What's really is at stake right now, and I think for civil society we can really mobilize around, is around negotiations on means of implementation. It's both the carrot that's being used by the European Union, but it's also the stick. As of June the 9th, we know that there are parts of the agreement on development and means of implementation. There is very little agreement between the ACP and the European Union. The ACP's position remains that any future agreement should, and maintain, should maintain special treatment for ACPs because of our historical relationship and privileged relationship with Europe and that there needs to be very clear links between the instrument and financing. The European Union, on the other hand, and from the very beginning have been very clear that the proposed EDF instrument will now be budgetized, which means that there will be no direct link between a future agreement and a development fund. And that's at stake, that's quite critical. A specified financial instrument will be established at a later date. EDF will be no longer, will no longer exist um, and will be replaced by what is called now the Neighborhood Development International Cooperation uh, Instrument. The ACP intra envelope will also no longer exist, but rather it will be absorbed by the NDICI. Geographical allocations will also shift. So for Sub-Sahara Africa, they are now looking at a 32 billion envelope. The Caribbean and Latin America, there is a Euro 4 billion envelope. And for Pacific and Asia, there's a 10 billion um, envelope. But the instruments have shifted from ACP and being merged. For Pacific, it's now merged with, uh, with Asia. Predictability and co-management of resources, which were principles in Cotonou, uh, will no longer be enshrined in a post-Cotonou uh, agreement. And that's quite substantive. The EU will use its own regulations governing the implementation of resources to govern uh, the financial instrument. Uh, and develop, including around co-financing. And I think the language around co-financing becomes quite critical that we can look and reconsider investigating what does co-financing then mean? Any activities and programs which do not fall under the scope of the NDICI will be financed through the Fund for Sustainable Development and the European Union Investment Facility. So that brings in new dimensions around financing. We really need to emphasize that, that this is probably an area that we can all worry, rally around. The second point about asymmetry is that if we're looking at the way asymmetry sits, any commitments, binding commitments, reforms will sit on Pacific or the African Caribbean side rather than the European side. Um, so if you're looking at attracting investments to the Pacific, we will shoulder disproportionately the burden of reform in our, in our economies. Institutional arrangement is probably another thing that's at stake that ACPs and particularly ACP civil society really have to consider. Uh, it's a divide and rule strategy that's happening right now by the European Union. 
The Cotonou really agreement provided the basis for regular political, economic um, dialogue for coherence, efficiency, and consultative uh, manners of cooperation. I have to say that even though the ACP has not been as efficient or as consultative as we'd like to see them, we do recognize that there are some forests in which the ACP is doing really well at. And particularly at the WTO level, we are seeing consolidation amongst ACP that's really important to watch. But the ACPs have their own institutional arrangements, internal decision makings, um, that's guided by the Georgetown Agreement. The European Union is really proposing a streamline to the institutional framework arrangement and to shift from an ACP to regional, uh, shift the center of, of negotiations to regional. So separating the solidarity that ACP has and is starting to gain traction on. To further complicate matters for the ACP, um, we've agreed to jointly cooperate and act as a global alliance pact, particularly in the multilateral system. And this is significant at the UN, at the WTO, you're really beginning to see some co coalescing around the, both the 79 and the European um, uh, member states. That has significant implication, which I'll come to very specifically uh, from the Pacific on several fronts. The first is on the climate change front, where you may not, well, where we may not have agreements with the European Union. What does that mean? On the climate change front, one of the biggest negotiating positions of the Pacific, which remains in bracket, is around maritime boundaries. Um, which is a key offensive interest for Pacific Island states in particular and in relation to climate change induced sea level rise. The fixed baselines from which the basis of pre-existing claims may be submerged. Um, the Pacific, and, and I'm not sure about the Caribbean, but certainly the, the Pacific through the ACP is seeking recognition from the EU in this agreement to promote ocean governance, maintain um, uh, states' rights and duty over resources and prevent loss of territory. So on climate change, maritime boundaries is a significant uh, issue for the Pacific um, and it's also tied to resources. Uh, when tracking the post Cotonou negotiations, I think for, for trade campaigners, it's also important to track what's happening at the WTO and to ensure that what gains we've maintained at the WTO, the post Cotonou agreement is not a backdoor entry point for European European offensive interests. In this sense, the, the fisheries resources for the Pacific is quite critical. Subsidies, the negotiations at the WTO, and the work by the ACP. I want to stress very strongly that the ACP is doing really well with support with, from India and South Africa to backstop on fisheries and subs, uh, fisheries subsidies negotiation. So I think we need to be very careful and we've been really bringing that type of analysis to the Pacific Protocol to say to negotiators in the Pacific they have to pay attention to what we've maintain at the WTO and ensure that post Cotonou does not allow for regression in language, particularly because it is offensive interests and quite different to the European interests around fisheries and fisheries subsidies. And I can talk and elaborate further during question time around fisheries subsidies and what's happening at the WTO. I think at the WTO, we've done really, really well as civil society to call for halt in negotiations, particularly on fisheries and digital um, trade negotiations. And I think that's a success story that we certainly can learn from in terms of post Cotonou. Um, I just want to really bring back the other key issue at stake here. And the positioning is a little bit different around oceans, blue economy, and access to natural, unfretted, undistorted access to natural resources. That's the language that's both in the protocols, but also in the foundational document. It simply implies the access by particularly European investors um, through, uh, and one of the points that, that, that 
Maroni raises is critical. It's really around land tenure systems and marine and maritime customary tenure systems in the Pacific. That's quite um, important when we're looking at what that means around access to resources that we simply need to defend and can rally and mobilize around. Uh, deep sea minerals is quite a big uh, push in the Pacific Protocol. Uh, really, to be clear, it's really a push that's coming very strongly from the Pacific. Um, in the uh, earlier drafts, March drafts in the Pacific Protocol, and certainly December drafts, it went from a whole chapter to one paragraph. And as I understand it now, um, the Pacific's positioning around deep sea mining and minerals is to ensure that deep sea minerals is simply reflected in blue economy text, oceans uh, and resources text, um, to ensure that within the 20 years, that is not a missed opportunity, or do they don't see that as a missed opportunity. From the European side, what we're seeing from text is the Europeans opposing the reference of deep sea minerals, um, and we don't understand why. Their rationale is that we have to wait for the International Seabed Authority to resolve the governance of resources and there is no need to reflect. However, we don't know whether that's a tactical position by the European Union around resources. It needs to be read in relation to EU's raw material strategy. So I think a lot of work can be done around that and mobilizing. Pacific civil society have been quite clear uh, we oppose, we call for a ban, and we certainly support a global moratorium on any uh, exploration and certainly for full exploitation of resources. The other key thing that's at stake, and probably Tete can talk a lot more to it, is the stage for EPA, which is Economic Partnership Agreement, and how um, that is tied to the post Cotonou Agreement. Um, the Pacific really concluded interim EPAs in 2007, which only applied to trading goods. Fiji and Papua New Guinea were the only two countries that signed, ratified under duress to protect both sugar and tuna industries. Um, subsequently, Samoa and Solomon Islands have acceded um, to the, the interim EPA agreements. Uh, negotiations for a comprehensive EPA on good beyond um, goods into services, investment, government procurement, and the rest uh, remains contested in the Pacific, and certainly the Europeans uh, have continued to push. Uh, as of June 9th, we know that states that have not taken any commitments in EPAs and oppose the linkages between EPAs, and, the, and certainly there's still opposition to linking the EPAs and the essential elements in the new agreement. I think this is, again, basis on which we can rally around and negotiate. Um, the European Union position as of, of the 9th of June, as we understand it, is that the EU wants to link uh, the trade agreement to broader objectives, which is around human rights and sustainable development, and to maintain the status quo where all EPAs have clauses linking them um, to the agreement. So that's, I think that's, those are just some key, uh, what's at stake. Um, and I think I can leave the rest to where we go from here. Thanks, Anita. Thank you, Maureen. That was, as you said, an incredible range of uh, remaining issues in brackets and really your focus on the critical financing uh, concerns of this agreement and how ACP solidarity at the WTO, for example, can confront uh, Europe's, as you called it, carrot and stick uh, strategy. Um, I guess this is of particular concern in the context of how hard ACP countries are hit by COVID-19 and sort of how that carrot and stick is being used in this context of, of uh, um, how badly affected the economies are. Uh, so let me turn to David uh, then. Um, the, the, and Maureen, you also mentioned the economic partnership agreements, the EPAs. Uh, in the context of the Caribbean, the Stop EPAs campaign uh, had far more rigorous civil society advocacy and activism um, in every region, and certainly the Caribbean. What lessons do you think can be drawn from that struggle in ensuring that uh, the Caribbean interests 
are defended in the post cotonou Agreement. Well, thank you very much, Anita, um, for inviting me to, to share some very brief thoughts on, on those questions. The, uh, I'm, I'm good afternoon, good evening, good morning to, to colleagues uh, wherever in the world you may be in the relevant time zones. I, I want to uh, sum up our lessons from the struggle against the EPAs, perhaps in, in three words, champions, alliances, and engagement. So um, let me just begin with champions. We, we had key individuals and organizations that were championing the interests of the people of the Caribbean, very broadly defined, different sectors, of course, and, and different organizations may have focused on particular sectors, but, but together there were, there were champions in civil society um, amongst um, a number of the NGOs, Caribbean Policy Development Center, which combined a range of, combines a range of NGOs in a regional network. Um, you had farmers engaged in that, women's organizations and others, developmental NGOs. And then there were a number of trade unions that got involved, not the entire union movement, but a number of trade unions got involved in, in, the, in the process of, of um, fighting against the EPAs and so on. And you had very important champions in the academic community, and in particular, I want to remember Professor Norman Govan, who sadly passed away, who was an important, uh, as an economist, highly respected economist in the Caribbean and, and throughout the world. Um, he, he championed the cause of, of stopping the EPA. So we had some important champions, and individually, I don't I say individually, organizations or individuals. Um, articulated those positions very clearly. And the, the second, second word I want to use is, is alliances because there was a coming together of, of these different um, interests um, and, and therefore we worked together in the campaigns and supported one another and so on. And that was very important so that a certain critical mass, if you wish, was being built across sectors and of course, in the Caribbean context, across Caribbean countries. Um, and that was important to ensure that there was sufficient weight behind the, the calls for um, the EPAs not to happen or for major, um, major changes in the, um, in the agreements that were being negotiated. So, so, so that issue of alliances was very, very important between sectors um, and across Caribbean countries. So that, that question about that is very important. The third one was engagement, because there was a lot of engagement between um, our, at, at several levels, there was engagement between the negotiators, the CARICOM negotiators, um, the, the Caribbean regional negotiating mechanism, because CARICOM had a regional negotiating mechanism that was responsible for negotiating. And apart from the technocrats, full-time technocrats, there were lead negotiators um, focusing on different aspects, services, um, trade in goods, agriculture, and so on. So um, the lead negotiators, together with this regional negotiating mechanism, did have a number of engagements, either of their own volition, where there were workshops and discussions and consultations and so on. And on the um, demand of civil society that insisted, as we insisted, that there be engagement and so on. And therefore, there was a forcing of the negotiators as well to engage with us. But there was engagement. And, and that, was, that was important because through the engagement, there was, there was a, a very important policy debate. And so part of the engagement was policy debate. And there was a very rigorous policy debate taking, or debates, I should say, taking place in the region during that period. Um, and, and civil society organizations had seminars and workshops on our own, and, and sometimes we'd invite some of the negotiators to be present. And so the, the policy debates were taking place in a very, very rigorous way. And that, that was also important um, to inform and educate and strengthen um, organizations in their civil society organizations in their response. And the policy debate also involved the private sector, 
um, as well as governments, as well as the CAICOM um, regional negotiating mechanism. So the, the engagement was at, at several levels um, that intersected and were separate at times and intersected and, and mm -hmm. at, at other times. But it, it did mean that there was a process taking place and, and there was therefore a sense, even though civil society may not have been at the negotiating table itself. In Trinidad and Tobago's case, we did have the opportunity to um, be at the table in, in, in some instances. In, in other countries, that was not the, the, the situation, but um, there was engagement and that was that was important the, the third the third one of, is that of mobilization and so there were efforts by a number of the civil society organizations some of the trade unions some of the um, ngos um, we did engage in mobilization there were some petition campaigns and so on launched and there were um, public um, public activities, um, rallies or meetings or workshops and seminars and so on, um, newspaper articles, uh, various discussion sessions in the media. So there was a level of mobilization. It did not result in huge mass mobilization, but organizations were able to put these questions uh, up for uh, our members' concern and interest and therefore I certainly, in the trade unions movement where I was at the time, we were able to, to therefore speak on behalf of the trade union movement um, on these questions because we would have engaged our, our second rank officers and others in it and, and so on. And therefore, when we passed a resolution or made a statement, it had the support of, of larger numbers of, of persons. So it wasn't a perfect mass mobilization. We'd have liked to do much more, but we did have some picket demonstrations and some other things like that. Um, I remember writing a letter to the minister of uh, one of the ministers here, I think the minister of trade or one of the ministers in Trinidad and Tobago, calling on the government not to sign the EPA um, agreement and other, other organizations in other countries were also petitioning their governments not to sign on. So in three words, there were champions of the issue, there were alliances being built, there were engagements taking place um, and um, and there was a certain level of mobilization. And I think those were the lessons of the EPA struggle. And certainly in this post Cotonou process, I have not seen uh, any of those three or four things that I mentioned evident, certainly not here in Trinidad and Tobago, and I haven't seen it pop up in the region either um, through whatever connections I still have with civil society. Apologies. Thank you, David. Um, it's so important to reflect on, on this kind of layers of uh, uh, in, in involvement across society uh, in this kind of mobilization and uh, what we can learn from this cross-movement, cross-sectoral, the regional institutions and, and so on, and the engagement. So I think this is much uh, that we can reflect on when we uh, plan how to move forward. Thank you for that. Rosalie, if I could turn to you kindly, um, how would you assess uh, the Caribbean experiences with implementing the economic partnership agreements and what lessons does that experience provide um, as the EU continues to pursue a similar strategy uh, with, uh, with the post Cotonou negotiations? Thank you very much, Anita. Um, I, the lens I want to use is to talk about a specific experience that we had in the region, um, focusing on the cultural industry. So I'm going to share a screen, um, basically to highlight um, what has happened in the past and basically um, where we want to go in the future. So um, I'm gonna just do that now. I think it's there. Yes. All right. So um, just have a little challenge here. I want to put full screen here. All right. Good. So um, cultural industry is, of course, very important um, across the world. Six percent of global economy, and important for us in the Caribbean. You know, we see ourselves as a creative people, and it's important to build the kind of resilience we need as we look beyond COVID. 
you know, more inclusive society, reducing the kinds of inequalities we've seen, and, and helping us to get to these ambitious goals we have in the Sustainable Development Goals. The provisions of the CARIFORUM EU EPA that was signed in 2008 uh, can be divided in two broad categories, one focusing on the market access provisions for entertainment services, and that provided access to um, about 26 European states, as well as the cultural cooperation provisions. These were embodied in the protocol on co um, cultural cooperation. Now, with respect to the market access, this was significant, and the commitments that were made that provided the kinds of access to entertainment professionals, um, as well as the provisions um, that were related to temporary movement, went way beyond the EU's GATS commitments. These are the General Agreement on Trading Services. And so it was seen as an important achievement on the cultural cooperation protocol. This aimed to very ambitiously address the structural imbalances and the asymmetrical patterns and so on. It was quite a, a, a sense that we can transform with these provisions. They will really give us that opening. The provisions that looked at joint cultural capacity building was significant because here we're talking about um, works being qualified as European works um, both in terms of content and quota requirement that would enter into the EU member states. And this was seen as very generous. Um, in fact, um, it was seen as more than mere cultural cooperation. That we're talking about market access and material support that was important for economic diversification and development. So, you know, be getting training, techniques, a number of things that was quite exciting at the time. And it was seen as precedent setting. It was the first international trade agreement that was made um, with, in, with, with respect to these kinds of provisions. And the European Commission talked about it as a showcase of implementation, a model for future engagement. The, our um, CARICOM, um, the regional negotiating machine was checked Director General saw it as historic, historic concession. And um, one of the analysts, David Jessop, referred to the protocol as the most innovative part of the whole 1,000 plus pages of text. So it was heralded as a big deal. What happened? Well, the access that was promised was frustrated frustrated by visa requirements and a number of issues. In fact, even trade officials had difficulties getting, you know, with their, even with their official diplomatic pass, passes, getting um, opportunities to attend meetings. They only had limited access, etc. It was even more difficult for CARIC Forum countries that did not have consular representation. There are other kinds of restricted access whether it was the sponsorship requirements for temporary access that re required codes, some of those codes were not in place, whether it was the eligibility requirements, um, all kinds of constraints that existed. All of it summed up to no evidence that these cultural provisions in the EPA contributed to the economic diversification and development that it promised. And many analysts came to that conclusion and several studies have been done. The most recent um, I saw was um, I think November in 2019 last year. And so you know there are all kinds of issues, the lack of financial commitments that underpin the protocols etc. And so the Europeans vision that this protocol on cultural um, cooperation would be a model didn't quite pan out um, and arguably um, what is being discussed and so on could be seen as merely cultural cooperation without that kind of ambitious economic impact. And some concluded that it was really more of a bargaining chip. So it was, uh, um, you heard from David talking about all the excitement and the engagement and people coming together and many of us were really energized because we thought this could really make a difference 
but it didn't in the final analysis. Um, but the outcomes were shaped, shaped, shaped not just by you know, what the EU did, but the decisions we made, both our governments and our people. It's important, I think, to reflect on that. Um, there was inadequate funding, not just coming from the EU, but, but in terms of our own provisioning um, of our own resources that could help us to effectively implement these provisions. We talked about the engagements around the negotiations, but the kinds of participatory governance that was needed in order to shape decisions that could impact the cultural industries, I thought were also limited. And where stakeholders were involved, the decisions made had no teeth, couldn't effectively translate to not just policy, because sometimes we're able to get policy, but importantly funding to implement those policy decisions. And in some ways one could think about it as a kind of overlance on a governmental approach, because there perhaps could be much more that non-governmental organizations, civil society and so on could do in pushing the barriers with respect to um, how we reshape this industry to take advantage of whatever the trade um, provisions enabled. So where do we go from here? I, I suggest there are two broad, broad paths, <clears throat> both to be pursued simultaneously. The first is of course to negotiate our best options in the current arrangement, to foster national, regional, um, international dialogue that can strengthen these positions. And here again, I want to commend reason we focus on this kind of dialogue. It's important that we all are kind of, you know, on the same page with respect to some of those positions. This will help. We may want to push for postponing the, the deadline. Um, and you've heard previous the, the discussions earlier about, you know, the, 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 the kind of, uh, yes, we need to push for, for a delay for these deadlines. Um, we have to try to make these protocol, protocols real. Um, and there's a lot of work that can be done there. We can improve market access. They've been talking about touring visas, etc. But I suggest that perhaps even more significant is a second path. And that is to use the opportunities brought on by COVID-19 to actively reposition our industries. Because with a repositioned industry and more active players, we can do more to exploit and benefit from whatever access are, is provided in the trade agreement. Um, and to exploit these online opportunities that now exist to penetrate EU markets that can overcome the market access limitations. And the best example I have is this recent bounty killer beanie man versus battle right and this is the is a, our two dancehall artists well known not only here in jamaica but globally and they had an instagram live event on may 23rd about half a million viewers tuned in including rihanna and all of these big sean paul and a lot of big artists and it created a real wake-up call for what's possible in the industry um, now that you can't really have these mass concerts anymore, at least for now. So that was significant. And in case you don't know anything about Versa, Versa and I didn't until I heard about um, the, this, this event, it's created by producer musicians Timbaland and Swiss Beat. And it's an online platform that brings together artists and some writers and people in the creative industry. And it highlights these you know, influential songs, but, it, but they have virtual competitions that can draw over 750,000 viewers. That's quite significant. And so I think the implications of all of this is that we need to build new capacity in the cultural entertainment industry to exploit new developments, new technologies that exist. We have to even redefine who are the new players. There are bloggers now and there are you know, brand um, consultants now that you know, can protect your brand online and, and so on. And these massive events, all of these things are important. So, so we, not, we have to build new capacity. Things like virtual reality technology is now being used to 
create all kinds of scenes that are important for the tourist industry. We're now talking about 3D virtual tourism environment. Um, again, new um, and, and, and important for the future, especially in the context where a lot of travel is now being restricted. The use of robotics and artificial intelligence, etc. all of these are providing a framework in which we can find and create new exportable goods and services that can transcend some of the market access challenges that we've seen for decades. And I think lastly, there's much more that can be done by the private and non-governmental sectors. And here I wear um, the hat of the chairperson of the Caribbean Philanthropic Alliance, that even philanthropy can be shaped in these kinds of directions to encourage and support initiatives that gives us a new um, new opportunities for the future. So I'll end here by saying that, you know, the EPA process started in 2008 at the brink of a global recession, and it will end at the brink of another even worse global economic recession or depression. And there are lots of lessons to have learned from the past, and we can talk about those later. But I think we have to learn from those lessons. We must reposition the industry and in so doing, exploit and create new opportunities that can reposition us in a better place in the future. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Rosalia. It was uh, really interesting to hear how and why um, the European Union's promises in IPA were not realized, especially for cultural workers. And, and really the challenging work of translating um, in, in the future, the post Cotonou agreement into national and regional policy that engages all sectors uh, that, that, that are critical to the vibrancy of that, of that sector. So thank you. Thank you very much for Thanks. that. Um, we'll move on to, to Tete uh, next and uh, the final panelists before we take uh, comments and questions from, from you all. Um, what, Tete, what is your reading of uh, the latest negotiating text uh, alongside, for example, the European Union's raw materials initiative, which really guarantees European companies access to mineral and ocean resources. So, so given this, how can African states really assert their sovereignty over natural resources and, and push for measures that, that can transform the primary commodity export dependency and, and those economic structures that are inherited from, from colonialism? Um, thank you very much, Anita, and uh, good evening and good morning and um, good afternoon to everybody else, wherever we are from the Caribbean, Pacific, Africa, and Europe, because I see some of my good old European friends and their participants lead to very difficult, very difficult questions that they've posed already. Um, I think what I'm going to do is that um, some of my colleagues have, you know, kind of uh, picked up on some of the key essential issues that have, have formed part the challenge for us civil society organizations. I would, um, in addressing some of the questions that Anita has posed to me also, refer a bit more to what I think is a challenge as Rosalie ended, a challenge going forward as what civil society can do. And, and therefore permit me to start by again emphasizing the fact that unlike other, unlike certainly the Cotonou negotiations where civil society organizations across the board for the Pacific, Caribbean, Pacific and, and Europe thought we had a common agenda to try and pursue something together. Today, we are operating much more in a much more difficult terrain. Um, different, civil, different pockets of civil society organizations have different types of access to individual governments or different regimes. And so our ability to actually work together on a common front is, is challenging at the moment. It's something that we have to think about carefully. Um, when, when we started this, uh, trying to engage with the, with the post cotonou negotiations as far back as March 2018, um, there are two things that are, were important that we have to think of now. The first of thing was that was how to really think of ACP solidarity together vis-a-vis -vis the European Union. Uh, or, uh, unfortunately, there were a number of people who thought that the ACP itself is a colonial relic. So ACP as such must be put aside. And the European Union certainly wanted to do that. Our understanding as civil society organizations from Africa, Caribbean, Pacific was that 
what was co what was colonial and neo-colonial about relationship was the content. What actually Europe wanted from the ICP country rather than the, the political the institutional arrangement. In fact, the ACP as a group allowed Africa, Caribbean, Pacific to present a common front to address what since Lome for sorry to Lome, the Lome agreement has been the maintenance of, of, of a relationship that allow Europe to have access to Africa, the economies and resources of Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific in exchange for development fund. Uh, and we thought that at this time, it was necessary to retain, at least among the Africans, Caribbeans, and Pacific, necessary to retain that front in order to strike out, to transform the content of the relationship, to allow Africa, Caribbean, Pacific, both together and separately to accept their sovereignty of their resources and use it for development. Now, that, this, are, this is an important fact to reassert in the light so that it, that allows us to read what has been happening since um, uh, 2018 and where we can go from there. Uh, in a certain sense, um, as, as Maureen from, from our friend Maureen has put already, the, the what access we have to the text, uh, I have I've looked at the uh, 12 March 2020 evolving draft that the parties have put together, but we know that that evolving draft has already, has already been superseded and there's more of evolving draft. What is interesting though, is that if you compare the draft that we have today and where it is going now, from what the European Union started with at the very beginning in 2018, there's a number of shifts, there's a number of resistances, there's a number of uh, areas in which we as a civil society can still see how we can plug into and see how best we can take it forward. It doesn't mean that the European Union has given up its agenda, it still has it there. So what I'll do quickly now is to try and just quickly state what the European Union agenda has been all this while from Lomé to now and see what the shifts are and how we can plug into it. As you all know, as, as I just said, um, from all the way back to Lomé, the, the, the driver of the relationship between African, Pacific and Caribbean countries on the one hand and the European Union on the other hand, has been about two things. For Europe, it was a question of how could they continue to have access to Africa, to the markets of the ACP, to the resources of the ACP, and the economy of the ACP in exchange for what is touted as aid and support. Uh, in the time of the Lomé Convention, it was easy because really the Europeans wanted access to raw materials much so badly because of the context that it was easily framed within the so-called export stabilization mechanisms for mine minerals and, and for commodity export in exchange for non-reciprocal trade uh, access to European Union you know, market. That arrangement, which existed, you know, you know, lasted for quite a while, came under strain, as we all know. And by 2000, at the entry to the Cotonou Agreement, there was an explicit attempt by the European Union you know, now to frame the relationship with the African, Caribbean, and Pacific countries as a free trade agreement where there will be comprehensive across the board liberalization and deregulation of Africa's economies in so that European investors, European products, and European participants have, have access to it. Uh, Cotonou Agreement then became, and Cotonou Agreement then became a two-track a two approach. The Cotonou Agreement itself will maintain the aid relationship and the trade relationship that was started with Lomé until 2020. And meanwhile, in the meantime, the European Union and the ACP campaign started a series of EPA agreements, which the Economic Partnership Agreement, which was then become the economic heart of the relationship, which was going to be just simply neoliberal liberalization and deregulation of our economies. As we all know, it was a comprehensive you know, attempt project, which included goods, services, investment, intellectual property, you know, capital, all across the board. Uh, thankfully, the resistance, the, the common resistance of ACP civil society, as uh, uh, David I just said, together with ACP governments, together with our European partners, also ensure that that agenda by the European Union stops somewhere. So that by, the, by 2014, all we had is a few interim agreements in Africa. And the Caribbean has got a comprehensive agreement, which whose limitations uh, uh, Rosalie had just talked about. 
So at the beginning of the post cotton negotiations in 2018, it was clear that the European Union wanted to take the post cotton as unfinished business to try and find out that the things that I couldn't get in the EPA agreement to put in the post cotton agreement. And it was very clear, I mean, almost everywhere that you look into the European Union's mandate, it wanted all the sovereign access to the oceans, all the sovereign access to minerals, it wanted to have services, it wanted intellectual, it was a, in fact, when we went to talk to some of the European Commission officials, we asked them, why is it that the trade and development, uh, development aid agreement has so much, you know, kind of prescriptive language on trade? Uh, at that time, we were also very worried that the mandate that was being developed by ACP countries was not clear in their resistance. I can say that if you look at the text that at least emerged on the, on, the, on the 20th of March, sorry, on the 12th of March, at least there has been some shift both in language and structure, but also there's a lot of open areas for contestation. Now, of course, the European Union still retains its objective. <laughs> To, to deregulate and open our economies for itself. But that deregulated objective is also now hedged by a stronger articulation, as far as I can read in the draft agreement, a stronger articulation by ACP countries of their own paradigm of development as they see it. So if you take maybe just uh, one area that's you know, uh, the title four on the preambula area, the, the Think. We talk about inclusive and sustainable development. In that area, you find what I think is uncomfortable and incoherent tension between the European Union's insistence of having an investment agreement which opens our economies to themselves. So the European Union still you know, says that you can see that we say that investment is important and that the countries agree, for instance, to protect investment and protect investors and assure fair treatment by having international investment agreements. Now that's the European Union's language, for instance. But certainly it is not as bad as it was when the European Union much more formulated in 2018 a more aggressive language. But that formulation of the of investment facilitation is part of a provision where you can see people are also talking about the need to transform primary community economy, to industrialize, and to have a development which is based on national strategy of development, national orientation, regional orientation. So in that same paragraph, we have these two contending, uh, as it were, paradigms there. Now, subsequent to that, you can find different, different areas where you can see there's a bracket. So people are talking about taxation. Uh, should you refer to the OECD uh, uh, based erosion and profit shifting? And what do you do about it? What language is there in the contention? Uh, in many places. And if you go away from the foundational pillar text to the other areas of the agreement, you can find a range of unevenness between Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific. In fact, in the Africa area, there's a whole section missing that I'm not sure whether it's because they are still fighting over it or that's it. Because in fact, the African, the, 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 the mandate that Africans adopted on the eve of the negotiations in March didn't have any reference out of the trade. And hopefully, maybe they're holding their ground and things like that. But the point that I'm making is that what we see is on the one hand, the European Union now trying to adopt different languages to still retain its interest, but at the same time forced to concede in the text some kind of broader pragmatic framing of the same thing. Now, we all know that the European Union is a very you know, pushy group which has used all manner of leverage, including blackmail about debt, about finance envelope and things like that to push its way through. And we cannot be sure how far our governments can, 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 can win this war of paradigms, for instance, and whether they're actually winning it and where, how far they are going. It is quite clear also that in the process of the negotiation, then the EPA has become even more important than what it was at the beginning, because I know that somewhere uh, six months ago, or not, not too long, even the European Parliament has to adopt a resolution on the EPAs, precisely because I suspect that it's beginning to look clear that the EPA and its implementation going forward will be a vehicle for, for at least as far as the European Union is concerned, for implementing some of the things that I couldn't put explicitly. Nevertheless, I'm not trying to create the impression that our African governments or ACP governments have got their way, no. Because as Maureen has pointed out, and as Mironi has pointed out, and as David and uh, 
Rosalia pointed out, there's still language in the area which is not the best. So the language around deep sea mining, the language around blue economy, there's still a contestation where the European Union, for instance, uh, wants undisturbed access in the strategic sector. Whereas from what I understand, the Pacific and Co are talking about how to manage the resources sustainably for development. That's a, a difference of language that we have to keep in mind in this field. So it seems to me that to conclude this thing, we have to ask ourselves, given where we are now, what is possible? Uh, we do know that the European Union is pushing to conclude a thing very soon. In fact, we have we are understand that they were trying to conclude in July, and maybe now they cannot conclude in July, they are pushing for it. What is possible in the short term between now and the space left for more agreement in the negotiations? And if, if we are not able to do anything in that space, what do we anticipate to do if the negotiation agreement comes to be? It seems to me that there are two things that we can think about. One, quite frankly, it is quite clear that our governments are, are stretched. And at the moment, I don't know any trade minister who has got the same attention to negotiating the details of tariffs as he has to trying to provide uh, protective and personal equipment and manufacture masks in this country to deal with COVID, right? And, and many, many more contexts in that. So in the same way in which civil society organizations in the, in the, in, in the around different negotiations have been able to call for a moratorium, a COVID-inspired moratorium for negotiation. There's nothing wrong for us to consider that. And in fact, our European friends who want to help us, uh, who, who are don't know what to do, who are wondering how they can support us, can ask their government whether or not they think that given all these pressures of managing a global pandemic, the insistence on going on the negotiation is a wise and reasonable and equitable thing to do. So there's a, a question about how we can give ourselves more space to regroup, to rethink again. But it seems to me that whatever we do, the, the post-cotonal agreement will just be the introduction of an agenda for struggle of policy implementation going forward. So in fact, what happens post the agreement, how we are able to recognize that the, the fundamental contestation between Europe and ACP still remains as a contestation about resources and sovereignty for our development. The recognition of that should inspire us to try and see what other uh, additional arrangement we should be, begin to make between now and even post the agreement. I think I'll, I'll stop here and then we can take questions and, and, and I can respond more things. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Tete, not only for historicizing the European Union's agenda since Lomé, uh, but also laying out the contestations that continue and some hopeful signs, I think, uh, from what you're saying of Africa, Caribbean, Pacific states holding some ground. Um, but you also started with the point of how our ability to work together is challenged. And so um, perhaps in the question and answer, uh, we can, we can uh, address that. So there's quite a few questions that have come up. I'll just uh, run through them and then uh, propose um, different ones of you on the panel to respond perhaps. And if some of you would like to uh, address it, please, please say so as, as I mentioned the question, so, so we'll know that, that you'll handle it. Uh, Marioni had mentioned uh, uh, that she'd like to expand upon the lessons for mobilization that um, David really laid out very well and um, that they also spoke to. What, what perspectives would you like to offer um, on, on how we can uh, mobilize uh, around these negotiations? Rosalia, a question came in from Marcia Brandon um, asking uh, that we must reposition the industry, um, but we also need a lot more education on the EPAs among the entrepreneurs in general and the NGOs in particular. So what is the strategy to change what exists presently and genuinely include civil society in uh, the drive to restructure Caribbean economies? A third question is uh, quite a complex set of questions from a European colleague um, uh, that touches on several issues, but, but ends uh, with um, a question about how European NGOs can resist uh, the agreement from their end, especially given the narratives uh, that they're receiving from the European Union that Africa, Caribbean and Pacific governments are simply in favor of the agreement. Uh, Maureen, you had flagged uh, that you'd, you'd like to respond to this. Um, 
Alexandrina Wong from, from Antigua asks, previously there was reference to the Millennium Development Goals in the Cotonou Agreement. Now with post-Cotonou, how had the Sustainable Development Goals been incorporated into the agreement? And um, would anyone like to answer this particular question about the SDGs? Um, a fifth question, the Africa-Caribbean Pacific Group was formed in the wake of uh, colonialism as, as a formal body promoting South-South unity and negotiating as a cohesive bloc. So why, why does South solidarity remain important today and how can we best foster it? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, um, yeah, and I think um, perhaps as part of that, that you could speak to uh, how we can continue the fight uh, as to pick up on your point of, of the need to uh, find ways of working together to, to bolster the fight uh, for, for Africa-Caribbean Pacific sovereignty over uh, not only their resources, but of their development path. Okay, um, so let's perhaps um, start in the same order. Marioni, would you like to address the the questions. Thank you, Anita. Um, yeah, at the end of my presentation, I briefly shared some of the lessons from uh, the Pacific CSO Collective um, in terms of mobilizing within the region on the post continue. Um, taking it forward, I think there's, as other speakers have mentioned, they, there is opportunity still, even though it looks like the text is all you know, completed and locked in, um, to challenge and propose um, on specific elements on things like civil society's uh, role that's been uh, still contention contentious. Um, I think the ACP uh, civil society together with EU civil society should engage this text that is still in brackets um, and call for more broad broader scopes of um, yeah that la language to suggest to, to to allow civil society to um, function within um, our respective regions under this agreement and to um, receive support for that. The other aspect is, and I think Maureen and others have mentioned, is about a collective call to halt negotiations, especially given um, the way the negotiations have currently gone under the COVID-19 uh, conditions. And before COVID, it was already done quite secretly secretly um, and getting access to the text, let alone speaking to negotiators um, and our government representatives was quite difficult. Um, we have been fortunate in the Pacific to have some cooperation from Pacific representatives um, in engagement. Um, I'm not sure about the other regions, but since COVID, um, the, the situation of COVID has pushed further the, the negotiating space onto virtual spaces um, and further away from us, our regions into Brussels. I think that there is an opportunity to mobilize civil society to request uh, a further delay in negotiations. Um, yeah, if anyone else would like to add, that's just from my side. Thanks, Mirani. Um, Rosalia, if you'd like to address the questions posed to you. Okay, good. Thanks, Marcia, for that question. Um, you know, I think uh, we, an important place to start is with the mindsets. You know, we in the Caribbean have for a long time looked outside ourselves for the answers. And if it's not the external world, um, it's our government, um, somebody else should find the answers for us. I, I do think that we begin to shift that mindset and talk about how we educate ourselves about the trade arrangements. Um, there are enough of us who understand and have been actively involved, as David pointed out in his presentation, that we can share the information, share the experiences. We can organize it. We don't have to wait for a governmental forum to do it, and we're doing it right now. So, so I, I think, Marcia, and, I, and I'm going to put it to you. Um, I know you have an organization there in Barbados. Um, let's put a forum together. Um, I know the CCTPC have been very active and been doing stuff. 
let's create that forum that can educate our people. Let's bring the individuals that we can influence around the table and let's talk about how we actively engage both the dialogue on one hand, but also in terms of active engagement is as to what it takes to increase and improve trade. That's about um, private sector actors doing practical things on the ground. So, and I want to link my response to your question to the question about the South South solidarity, that we build South South solidarity by reaching out to actors across the South and engage active actively practically engage in a number of things whether it's through trade arrangements and so on and perhaps we can shift the way we do trade negotiations where it's kind of a, like a top-down approach to trade negotiations put positions on the table open door and so on and then expect the economic actors to come in um, we've not seen that work and i think that we now have to drive it from a bottom up where the economic actors say this is what we're trying to do how can your trade arrangement help that and if we think about market access and all the focus that we've had on market access what the beanie man bounty killer um, experiment and experience has shown is that we can tear down market access using online mechanisms to get into markets that were restricted you know, and so it, it's what we do that counts because then the question is how can the trade negotiations enhance that? You know, what else can we do to get more based on our own efforts to redefine the terms of engagements? And, and that's kind of where my head space is and I think that we can do more and I put it to you, Master, let's get together, let's create some online forums and let's educate Caribbean people about these discussions. Thank you, Rosalia. Okay. Maureen, uh, you had offered to pick up a question. Um, just to, in relation to Francesca's um, question, sets of questions on the ACP and ACP configuration and also the deep sea mining question. I think Tete has really responded very clearly uh, and differentiating what was the context in 2018 around the questions of whether ACP is still relevant, do we still want it as ACP? I think my message really, as of today, ACP in the negotiating text is consolidated. They are clearly articulating that they want the kinds, the recognition, the kinds of arrangements that was in Cotonou, that was offered in Cotonou around political, economic uh, coherence, support for um, a secretariat that still needs to function. And I think this is really quite clear. We may have come from a state of confusion as ACP, but the states in the negotiating text you can see are starting to consolidate. So it raises several challenges, particularly about approaches. If the EU is seeking to go and move and shift the centers of power to region, I think there are significant questions that we have to think about. Secondly, it challenges the Europeans uh, positioning around wanting to consolidate uh, at the multilateral level. To do that and do it effectively, ACP needs to remain as a formidable grouping. And so I think these are some of the challenges and are certainly messages that, that should be sent back to Europe around ACP um, that we are seeing now. On the question of deep sea minerals, it is true that the Pacific has been the, at the forefront of pushing deep sea mining. There are two parts to the deep sea mining questions. One is within national jurisdictions and certainly one is beyond national jurisdictions where EU uh, you investors are quite active around contracts. So Belgium has a contract with the government of the Cook Islands. Um, that's one contract. So I think for us, our, our position to our European colleagues is certainly support the European position, um, which is to ensure that it doesn't reflect in the Cotonou Agreement. From our side, we need to do more work to see how we can balance the huge pushback 
uh, within our territories in EEZ around deep sea mining. But it's a languaging thing. So at the moment, the, the suggestion is to simply keep deep sea mining or minerals in the tech somewhere that we can resolve in the future. I think Tete's point is that we need to see this as the basis for struggles uh, in the next 20 years. So I think the contestation is whether deep sea minerals will appear in this text, in what form will it appear, and then we fight to see where moratorium will rest. But for our European colleagues, what we are saying is support your government and the European position on deep sea mining. From our side, we will have to resolve with our own states whether it should appear or not. That's it. Thank you, Maureen. Um, David, would you like to respond to any of the, the issues posed or make any closing comments before I hand uh, the last set of questions to Tete? Yeah, very quickly, just to, just to add to what um, Rosalia said. Um, in fact, while, while just after Rosalia spoke in her presentation, I sent her an email um, inviting her to a webinar that we are having in a couple of hours on the issue of the creative imagination and sport as key to diversification as a series of webinars we are having here in Trinidad and Tobago on the issue of um, COVID-19, not just recovery, but changing, change, well, we talk about changing Trinidad and Tobago, but, but changing generally. And so I, I want to just make two very quick comments. I agree 100%. We have to focus on um, expanding our productive capacity, both in terms of goods and services and across the whole range in which we have, um, we have uh, a competitive and comparative advantage. And we, we also have to come back, certainly in the Caribbean, to the issue of the Caribbean single market and economy, because the CSME ball was dropped precisely at the time that our governments and the CRNM engaged in the whole EPA negotiations. Um, and, and so I, I think this is a moment, certainly with, with COVID, for us to refocus on the internal dynamics of our economies, um, not, not just our individual economies, but certainly our regional economy when we talk about the Caribbean, and to expand South-South um, solidarity and cooperation in terms of the Caribbean, Africa, first in the Caribbean, Latin America, of course, and, and, and the Pacific in terms of trade relations. And I think those are some of the things that um, civil society can also push our governments towards, towards developing. And because trade has to be an outcome of what we produce. And I remember discussing with the lead negotiator for CARICOM on the, on the trading goods one, and he said, well, we got 100% we got access to the, to the market, the European market. I said, well, yes, but we've had access to markets before. That didn't result in an increase in our output. So don't think that that was a big gain. Um, and right now, I think that certainly from what I've been hearing, the manufacturers and other producers here in Trinidad and Tobago are very concerned about the 10-year period now for which um, EU imports can come in um, at zero or near zero tariffs into our region, um, certainly to Trinidad and Tobago, because we had a 10-year uh, period. And, and so we're going to feel some of the full impacts of, of that free trade agreement, as, as Tete was so correctly describing it a very neoliberal free trade agreement with the field impacts of that. This is a moment for us to refocus on where we are and how do we build our economies for resilience and sustainability going forward. Thank you, David. We've actually reached an hour and a half of the webinar and if we could indulge all the um, participants uh, to hang on just a bit longer to hear Tete's response and then a brief closing. Uh, Tete, please, if you could respond to the remaining questions. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question about the ACP role in South-South cooperation actually connects back to the question, part of which um, um, Maureen answered that our friend Francisco Mari has posed about the ACP as a neo-colonial construct. And I think it's important to understand that because it clarifies also the kind of relationship that we in the ACP, a civil society, can build with our European friends, because I don't know, that Francisco Mari and Bear for the World, for example, found that position about th think that the ACP is so new that they find it difficult to work with that structure. But we have to bridge that gap. So that especially because, as he says, Germany is going to the presidency of the, of the European Union during the conclusion of the negotiation, it becomes clear, right? Now, as I said, 
we have to, when we are talking about colonialism and neocolonialism, we have to make a distinction between the content, the economic content relationships that exist between Europe and Africa and the Caribbean Pacific. We know that, that Europe is interested in our resources and our markets and our economy and everything. And it wants to continue that partner relationship. Why, of course, Europe has the same relationship with other parts of the world, but why is Africa, Caribbean, Pacific unique? Because the nature of the colonialism that the European countries, France, UK, and coast, left in Africa, Caribbean, Pacific was unique. So Japanese colonialism in Korea, when they left, there were still at least the traces of industrialization. In UK and French government, whatever industrial project, uh, industrialization element that they met when they came to Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific, they destroyed it and transformed their economies only to raw material export economies. So African, Caribbean, and Pacific economies still retain their place in the international economic order as exporters of unprocessed, non-value-added you know, primary commodities. And therefore, we have a common interest in the globe today to meet together as Africa, Pacific, to learn how to transform our economy, how to assert that sovereignty, how to work together. So staying together as ACP institutionally, in fact, is important for cross-regional solidarity to confront what Europe and America and Asia and everybody else is trying still to perpetuate, right? That is where we understand the challenge of neocolonialism coming from, from the content not the institutional arrangement. Of course, the ACP Secretariat can be improved. We believe that the Africans and the Pacifics and the Caribbean should pay for their own ACP Secretariat rather than get the European Union to pay for it. Huh? We can do all that. But then what it means that our European brothers and sisters must understand that we think that working together, we can defeat new colonialism. So if that is what worries them, we are talking about South-South cooperation in the era in which our primary commodity dependent, whether it is in tourism, minerals, deep sea mining, is being reinforced because the European Union wants access and want to challenge that. So if, if there's any message to take to this thing, we are actually asking our German friends that they should flip their understanding of new colonial parties to talk about the content of the relationships, the patterns of economic development, which we must deconstruct. And then we can find out what kind of political structure we can build together to change that. So, so far, the South-South cooperation is important. We, the ACP group, actually have been very you know, uh, uh, instrumental not in, the, in the WTO, not simply having ACP group, but also working with LDCs, also working with G77 and co to pre 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 present a common front, whether it's in the climate change negotiation, WTO negotiating, SDGs and things like that. And that, that so South-South cooperation really, it is, it, it, because these are the biggest group of countries in the South, they also provide a very you know, important engine and muscle for making sure that South-South cooperation still goes on. And South-South cooperation is now needed even more than ever when it was launched in the non aligned movement earlier on during the Bandung Conference and Co. So anyway, I think I have uh, I've been comprehensive enough. I can leave it here. And uh, thanks for the indulgence of all the participants. Thank you very much, Pepe. And thank you once again to all uh, of our panelists uh, from Africa, Caribbean and Pacific uh, countries and to really to everyone uh, watching today and to your engagement. Um, we hope that this has been a useful update, um, useful sharing of analysis uh, of a very important process uh, that is unfolding and which we still have the power uh, to shape together. Uh, in terms of the follow-up, we will send an email to all attendees with a recording of this webinar and details of the next webinars in the Gender and Trade Coalition series. But the co-organizers of this uh, webinar will also uh, get together for a sort of debrief and a strategizing um, to, to figure out you know, how we can encourage uh, further active engagement with you all. Um, I mean, there's been talk on this call already about, you know, within the region, um, how we uh, uh, engage with national and regional policymaking around these kinds of agreements. Um, there's been talk about uh, potentially calling for a postponement um, of, of the negotiations and what, what would that entail? Um, some of the European colleagues have also uh, raised issues that really raise the need for greater dialogue with, um, uh, Africa, Caribbean, Pacific activists with uh, European colleagues of how, how we really can defeat uh, the neocolonialist approach.
Um, so I think we'll take time to reflect on this and figure out how we can engage. And if any of you engaging have any questions or would like to get in touch um, with any of us, please do reach out to us at team at regionsrefocus.org. You should have that email um, uh, in, your, in your acceptance uh, to, to join this webinar. Um, so wishing you all a wonderful morning, a wonderful evening, a wonderful night. And we hope to see you on the next webinar. Thank you all very much. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thanks.